introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Ted Leo. And um, you're originally from New Jersey, is that I correct? Am. Okay. So you've been playing music for a really long time. I have. <laughs> when did you first start playing guitar? You know, I didn't really start. I didn't really start playing guitar until I was like, you know, eighteen, nineteen, in earnest. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm forty six now, so that is oh, is okay. a long time now. But you know, like, I feel like most people start a little bit earlier. You know. Yeah. What made you want to pick up the guitar? Hmm, that's a good question. I mean. I'd been, I'd actually been in bands just singing before I started playing guitar, um, uh, but I think I just always want, I always wanted to, and for whatever reason, I just never did. Like, uh, you know, my parents never really like, you know, pushed me to take lessons or anything, but also didn't, you know get me a guitar <laughs> so it wasn't like so it was just like eventually when I was old enough to be like to be making those decisions a little bit more yeah. on my own you know I did it so yeah. what kind of music did you listen to growing up um you know without meaning to be coy I, I would say literally all kinds but I got into I mean I did get into punk really young um I was uh paying attention to it to band you know bands like uh the Jam and The Clash and Adam and the Ants when I was like 10 years old. Wow. <laughs> um, but I also listened to, um, I was into hip hop in the early 80s. And when I got into high school, I sort of got back into punk and I listened to a lot of punk and a lot of reggae. So what, um, do you think hip hop and that kind of music also inspire, influences your music? Oh yeah, without a doubt. I mean... You know, I'll say this, like, I, look, I, I think that, <laughs> I think that for me to claim that, like, there's hip-hop in my music might be a little too much, but I think that it's, it's sort of more than the earlier punk that I was into. When I got into, into hip-hop in, like, you know, 82, 83, those years, I think it got my head thinking in ways that, you know, rock music wasn't making me think back then. It started making me think more politically and... Etc. And um, yeah. So, what do you think politic? Like, what about politically? Did hip hop make you think about? Well, okay. So I grew up in a pretty urban area of New Jersey, like right outside of New York City. It was very integrated. Um, you know, there's always racism everywhere. I'm not gonna say there was no racism, but like, honestly, it wasn't even. Like, I think it actually, like, it was a little bit like Sesame Street, you know, it's like, all the kids, like, you know, playing in the street, like, the, you know, giant Irish family with 19 red-haired kids across the street from me, and then, like, a Jewish family to the right of us, and then the black family to the left of us, you know, and everybody was hanging out in the street and playing, you know, kickball or whatever, you know, and running out of the way when cars came through, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, uh, and that, you know, that really continu continued that nice little bubble for me in my own personal like immediate experience with people probably until I got a little older and um, you know went to college in Indiana and started seeing things a little more in your face but um, but I think that what hip what hip hop did for me early on was to take me outside of my immediate bubble you know to like Help me understand that um, uh, there are things that people are going through, you know, in my own neighborhood that are not yeah. going to necessarily be part of my immediate experience. Um, but that because someone is making art about it, they're offering me a window into some understanding. Um, so, do you still listen to a lot of different types of music? Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you feel that your music has a lot of political ideology behind it? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not yeah, familiar to with a your, fault sometimes. Yeah, I'm not yeah. familiar with their whole catalog. Oh, but yeah, your yeah. first um, song that I ever heard was "Me and Mia," uh -huh. 
and I really like that one. Oh, thanks. Um, it felt kind of, and you talk about hunger strike. Is that what that song's about? The song is well. That song is more about personal, like a personal struggle or relationship to society vis-a-vis like body image and you know people's issues with weight and food and how you know in a modern um, wealthy society uh, we sometimes drive ourselves into self-destructive behavior you know uh, because of uh, that that shouldn't that we shouldn't need to uh, to do to ourselves um, you know because of the uh, of, of other pressures that Western or any society is supposed to put on. So, uh, how do you feel about the new things that are happening politically currently? Are you assuming you're referring to, <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming you're referring to the election? Uh, well, I mean, you gotta. I don't think we have time for me to tell you all about how I'm feeling about it. Um, I mean, where to begin? I mean, I'll, I'll make it as I'll put it in the simplest terms that I can. Like, I think it's appalling that a man who has so obviously um, expressed and aligned himself with uh, well expressed explicitly his intent um to enact racist policies against portions of the population that don't fit a certain profile to, uh, you know, brag about having used this position to physically abuse and assault women, um, to just repeatedly lie about anything and everything. I think it's insane that this person is the president elect um, <laughs> and if you want to take the tack that like he does you know if that doesn't get to you then the people he surrounds him with who are actually like straight up associates of racist news outlets racist organizations people call it the well, call it the alt-right and white nationalism and etc but fuck it's fucking it's just it's just racism it's, yeah. it's you know like there's it's um, and, uh, it's still shocking to me that in 2016, that this could happen and all of the arguments about economic anxiety and it being a quote unquote change election and et cetera. Um, I have a lot of sympathy for, but my sympathy stops when the standard bearer for you know, being a champion of the poor working class in this country, uh, like, foments, like, fiery racial animus, you know, not just yeah. like, not just like, I mean, I can't even, I can't believe I'm saying this, like, this would be better, but, you know, not just, like, the sort of run-of-the-mill closeted shit that you see yeah. all the time, you know? Um, Letting their racist flag fly so yeah, the one. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go a step further and say that um, I completely recognize that Hillary, I don't think Hillary Clinton was the perfect candidate in a lot of ways, and I have had my criticisms about her and the, the you know, Democratic... Um, party machinery for a long time, but uh, I think she would have been a good president. I think that the Democratic platform that she was working with is progressive and 
would have obviously been a better choice for people feeling economic anxiety yeah. right now. Um, and I was kind of excited to see a woman in the job, to be honest that with you. And cool. there's that aspect of it too. That's like, you know, it's, that's just a resounding rejection of like all the good things that I, you know, that I thought the direction of, uh, yeah. of our country was generally headed, you know? So that's how I feel. About it. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously the punk scene is known for being kind of rebellious. Do you see the punk scene growing? I don't know. You know, people tweet, people have been tweeting stuff at me too. Like, well, we're really looking forward to, you know, I guess the silver lining is there'll be some good, you know, punk songs. Uh, so there'll be some good, you know, political Ted Leo songs. And I just honestly, like, it makes me really angry and it makes me not want to make any music because like, wow. because like, that's not a fucking silver lining. Like, it's not a joke, you know? Like, yeah. people are going to suffer. Like, people are really going to suffer. And and I'm going to say this. You are interviewing me. I am obviously a very white person, you know? <laughs> but, like, white punk kids being excited about punk music is almost like the height of white privilege in a way it's like fucking you know enjoy that uh whatever you're blasting you know on your spotify while you drive by the fucking brown people internment camp that yeah. is gonna happen you know like it's not a joke and i don't think it's funny and i really like i really i i mean i'm i think i'm Again, I'm very white, so you can probably tell me, but I'm, I feel like I'm flushing right now because I'm, it's, it actually makes me really angry. I think it's a, I think it's a real... I mean, obviously, it's going to happen, and I hope that it helps not just what I do, but what, you know, all, like art in general is what helps people through these times. Like, yeah. I'm glad for that. I'm glad that there are people out there who, who are going to be addressing this with the art that they make. But like at this juncture, to be sort of making these flip comments about like being psyched about that is a little off-putting to me. How do we get people to move? I mean, I guess that's a mm. million dollar question. Well. What's next? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I have an answer for that. I think that um, I've, I've literally been on tour since the day after the election, so my world has been night by night, you know, trying to read the vibe of the room and speaking to where I'm at and, you know, just talking to people where they're at. Um, and I haven't had a ton of, and since I'm just traveling alone right now, like I'm driving all day by myself, you know, so I, I haven't had a ton of time to, um, you know, do a lot of reading or a lot of thinking, um, about specific strategies, uh, for moving forward. I'm sure that those strategies will arise if they're not already there and I just haven't, you know, connected with them yet. But, um, um, you know, and I've seen it, as the weeks have gone by, I've like, again, like trying to read a room and like see like what's happening. Like, do people want to talk more? Do people just want to hear my songs or whatever? Like, I've gotten my rap every night down to like a little bit more of a succinct um, way to say what I'm feeling, and it it's basically just that like there's definitely going to be a lot to do people are going to have to push themselves outside of their comfort zones to um, actually do some like real work. And there are people who are great organizers and, um, you know, I know that they're going to do what they can do. I think like the basic level of responsibility that is incumbent on all of us from the 
from the very present moment, like before we figure out what we're going to do next through when we start doing what we're going to do next is no matter where you're at on the social ladder, um, but speaking to kind of like my own community specifically, um, as bad as we we're all feeling like there are definitely more, uh, marginalized and more vulnerable people who are going to take the brunt of yeah. um, a lot of what's coming down the pike, whether it's, um, you know, a Muslim registry or repealing, you know, 25 different aspects of the ACA that's going to result in a, you know, complete... Uh, turnaround and women's access to health care, you know. Um, there's always going to be some somebody, most of the time, most of the time, there's going to be somebody who's going to be worse off in this next phase of American history than, you know, we are. And, like, the challenge is to, uh, the basic challenge, I think, is to, figure out uh, how to be there for those people you know if they're in your neighborhood or if you have the time and energy to expand your own you know uh, reach understanding how to be a better ally and a better advocate for for the people who are more vulnerable than we are Politics aside, um, being a rock musician is very glamorized, but it's really a lot of hard work, a lot of long nights. So what keeps you moving through towns and driving, and what's yeah. at the heart of it for Ted Leo? Um, I just look, I just like doing it, honestly. Like, um, I, you know, like, like we were talking before about how long it's been since I've been to Albany, you know, one does not book a book a tour the day before one leaves. So I didn't. When I was thinking about this trip and booking it back over the summer, like the late summer, I wasn't thinking about the fact that oh, it starts the day after the election. You know, <laughs> what I was thinking about was like uh, a friend of mine in Atlanta was like, hey, I got you know got this thing going on. I should come down and play one Thursday night. Or I was like, okay, yeah, that's a good idea. Maybe I can do a little solo thing and pin some other dates around it to places that I haven't been in a long time. So. This whole trip has been kind of like that, and um, there's really no other grand goal to it for me other than to do that. Like, I like traveling, I like um, I like seeing different places. If I haven't been to a place in a long time, I like going back to that place, mm. you know? Um, seeing how it's the same, seeing how it's changed, and... Uh, talking to people and etc and I like playing music I mean that's really what it comes down to I guess at the end of it all so. to wrap up on a positive note do you have any good stories that you can share that you've experienced from my like your journeys uh, over of all time from of yeah. all like hmm I mean yeah what like help me what help me uh, focus on on that like what kind of I don't know. Um, the Bouncing Souls told me a funny story about um, them drinking with Dave Grohl, who pulled out some moonshine, <laughs> and then proceeded to play a huge set after that while they were like barely able to stand. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, all right. Well, um, <laughs> all right. That puts me in mind of a uh, because you mentioned both the Bouncing Souls and drinking. This is a really dumb story, actually, but. Since we're, if we're talking about drinking, um, I kind of want to say it was 12, 14 years ago, 12 years ago, maybe something like that. No, wait, no. So I remember we were playing a song that was on an album that came out in 03, so it was probably like 14 years ago. Uh -huh. um, my band was playing this place at, at Princeton. Um, you know, because that's in Jersey, and you said Bouncing Souls, that reminded me of that, but, um, and, uh, you know, we got there, we got set up, and, you know, blah, blah, we're hanging out before we play, and, um, 
the guy was doing the show, like they had, there was like a bar in the bottom of the thing, and um, but it was like only beer, and I don't really drink a lot of beer. I was like, do you have anything else that I could a drink with? And he was like, let me go see. I'll go back to my dorm. So he went back to his dorm. And he came back, and he's like, well, I got some vitamin water. I was like, all right. <laughs> he was like, and some Everclear. <laughs> and I was like, uh, okay, sure. So I, I, I mixed vitamin water and Everclear, and I'm not going to recommend that anybody do this, um, but it made me feel like Superman for about three hours. <laughs> and so we, the, the place was like packed out, and there were like we're playing in front of these windows and um play this super long set and you know like third encore like my band is like done and i was like get, get back in and, like, and uh we started opening the windows and letting people in and then they it got us banned from Princeton. <laughs> oh wow <laughs> that's a really good story <laughs> any yeah. music coming out with the pharmacist anytime uh soon? yeah in the spring mm -hmm. cool looking forward to it well, this has been Alicia for the Sanctuary for Independent Media with Ted Leo. Thank you, Alicia. And that would be a wrap. Thank you. So I want to get a picture somewhere cool. I don't know if there's space down here.